everyone. Welcome to Amlet's fireside chat on artificial intelligence driven IVF. Today, millions of IVF cycles take place every year and new cutting edge technology is helping improve success rates. But as with everything, there's still room for improvement, isn't it? And that's where artificial intelligence comes in. Tomorrow, as we celebrate World IVF Day, let's discuss on how artificial intelligence is helping couples get pregnant quicker with less cycles. Amulet is a health and wellness community with the vision of making every person on the planet healthier than they were before. The Amulet app available on Play Store connects you with the expert doctors for seamless virtual consultations, tracks your health and provides validated articles that help you stay informed and healthy. I'm Sheer, your host for the evening, and this is an interactive fireside chat where we shall discuss the role of AI and how it impacts success rates in the first 30 to 40 minutes. And then we will take questions from our audience. But if you think of any questions during the session, feel free to send them across by chat and we shall answer them when we finish the chat. Now, I would like to introduce to you our panelists. Dr. Michelle Perugini. Michelle Perugini is an entrepreneur, academic, and an internationally renowned expert in health, medical research, advanced analytics, and artificial intelligence. Michelle is now the co-founder and CEO of Presagen, an AI healthcare company focused on building scalable AI products for women's health. Welcome, Michelle. Yes. Thank you. So, uh, yeah. So, Dr. Vani Sundrapandian. Dr. Vani is an internationally accredited reproduction medicine specialist with over 20 years of experience and is the medical director of Jenanam Fertility Center, Chennai. Jenanam is a standalone fertility center and is rated one of the three best fertility centers in Chennai and has been a front runner in implementing modern technology in IVF. Welcome, Dr. Vani. Thank you. So, Dr. Sujata Ramakrishnan. Sujata Ramakrishnan is an eminent embryologist and head of embryology at NOVA IVF. She has over 25 years of hands-on clinical embryology experience and has started fertility centers from scratch and led them to become high performance units. Welcome, Dr. Sujata. Thank you very much. So now let's move on to our session. So Dr. Vani, this one's for you. What is the success rate of IVF procedures in India? Right, um, first of all, I'd like to thank Amulet uh, for giving me this opportunity. And um, thank you once again, Basuda, for that kind introduction. Right. Um, coming to the success rate of IVF in India, well, let's look at look at it on a global basis. On a global basis, it's about 30 to 35 percent per cycle. So one cycle means one ovarian stimulation followed by transfer of whatever embryos we get from that cycle. So that is about 30 to 35 percent. And the cumulative pregnancy rate, that is the success with three consecutive cycles, will be about 40 to 50 percent, 45 to 50 percent. This is global and the same applies to India as well. Um, but uh, we need to remember the fact that age, the woman's age, is a very or the only strong determinant um, of a pregnancy. So if a lady is less than uh, 35 years old, her chance of conception in the first cycle will be much higher and is almost 50 to 55 percent. And after 35 years, because of a reduction in egg number and egg quality, obviously her chance of pregnancy or success with IVF would go down quite uh, steeply. And by 40 years, it usually is very low. On the other hand, if a woman beyond 40 years chooses to have an egg donor, the success rate is once again very high and is over about 70%. 
So this success rate is not consistent from clinic to clinic here in India, and it really varies with the expertise of the clinician uh, and the embryologist, the lab setup, and the maintenance of the lab. Um, so this is the answer to that question. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Vani. So, um, Dr. Sujata, as an embryologist, what factors impact IVF success rate? Uh, thank you very much again for this opportunity. So, uh, see, as Dr. Vani had mentioned, age of the patient is a major uh, factor. Okay. But from an embryologist's perspective, I would think the quality of embryos and the choice of embryos or the embryo selection methods are the two major factors which actually can impact the uh, success rate. Okay, so for, if you're talking about the quality of the egg and the sperm coming to the lab, definitely is a factor, but that is beyond our control. We do not have any control on that. Assuming that we get good uh, eggs and good sperm into our laboratory, then we feel that the way we culture those uh, uh, or, you know, like the way we make or create embryos from those egg and sperm and how we uh, grow it in the laboratory is a major uh, factor. You know, like you have to have all your conditions perfect because here we are trying to mimic a uterine atmosphere in the laboratory, which is very, very challenging. And so once you get all your embryos right, now the next uh, factor is how would you choose the best embryo, that embryo which actually would result in a live, healthy child. So that is also another uh, factor which can impact success rate. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Sujata. So, uh, Michel, this one's for you. So how does Life Whisperer impact this success rate? Thank you so much. And I really want to thank um, Amulet also for inviting me onto this session today. And also thanks to Dr. Vani and Sujatha for joining. Um, Life Whisperer is really interesting. It's an artificial intelligence application. And essentially what it does is it helps the embryologist with selecting the healthiest embryo or the embryo that is most likely to lead to a pregnancy during the IVF process. And as Sujatha just mentioned, selecting that healthy embryo is really important to, and it's critical to a successful pregnancy outcome. And what the AI does is actually um, analyze thousands of historical images, and it's able to then determine which features of those images or which features of embryos relate to a, a positive pregnancy outcome or a negative pregnancy outcome. So in a way, it becomes predictive of whether an embryo is likely to lead to a pregnancy. And so it's a very useful tool to be able to guide the embryologist in that selection process. And it's quite standardized. So every time that the AI is utilized, um, it uses the same measurements, the same objective scoring measurements to be able to analyze each of those embryos. And because Life Whisper increases the likelihood of knowing what the healthiest embryo is and helps in that selection process, then it can help to improve the success rates of IVF for those patients that are using the technology. Okay, thank you, Michelle. So, uh, so Dr. Vani, what are the common challenges that you face in IVF, especially from being a specialist? I'd like to hear that from you. Well, um... I think the biggest challenge is actually not maintaining the pregnancy rate, but constantly trying to improve the pregnancy rates in any clinic. Um, we mustn't forget that um, IVF itself is expensive treatment and uh, it is time consuming as well. And not everybody gets pregnant in the first cycle. Now, most of the women who actually come for treatment today are working and they need to get back to work quickly. So the challenge is not just getting them pregnant, but to do it as quickly as possible. Uh, for me, I think uh, as a fertility specialist, personalization or individualization of care is very important. So we choose the right protocol, we choose the right medication based on the patient's age and her ovarian reserve and other parameters, and try to generate a good number of good quality eggs. So once the eggs arrive, it's in the um, embryologist's quote really to try her best or his best to generate good quality embryos. And once we have the embryos, then we need to pick the best embryo for transfer. 
So all this is a challenge. And I think the additional challenge these days is for fertility specialists to usually to actually open up uh, to these newer technologies and to implement them and to try to improve the success rate and the time to pregnancy. Okay, okay. Thank you, doctor. So uh, as an embryologist, this one's for Dr. Sujata. Uh, what are the challenges that you are facing, ma'am? Oh, if I uh, start uh, actually listing the challenges, I think this one hour would not be enough because the uh, success rate or uh, not even success rate, like getting a good embryo, it, I think it depends on some 300 and odd variables and majority of them hovering around the lab. So one of the major challenges is to maintain the culture system, okay? Because we are working with machines and you know, like it is, you know, it's something, how much ever you do, uh, uh, you know, proactive maintenance and things like that, still, you know, like working with machines is, it's a challenge. Uh, power supply, you are not able to maintain the temperature, you're not able to maintain the pH. And so, you know, like to have a stable culture system itself is a big challenge. Now you get over that, and then you get some embryos. The next challenge is picking up the right one. Sometimes, you know, like all of them would look the same. Say, for example, if a patient has 10 embryos and most of them would look the same. And so you are in a dilemma, which one to pick up, you know, which is that embryo, which is actually going to uh, result in pregnancy. You see, there are a lot of, uh, uh, you know, evidence in the literature where they say even a good looking embryo can be genetically compromised. So that is an issue. Now, again, an embryo, see when you select an embryo, there are a lot of factors. You wouldn't know which one to give priority. Say, for example, if you are looking at a day five embryo, it has two types of cells. It has inner cell mass and it has trophectoderm. Okay. So one trophectoderm would help the embryo to stick to the uterus. Inner cell mass is the one which actually develops into a baby. Now, some embryos will have good trophectoderm, but a compromised inner cell mass, and it can be the other way also. So the problem here is for the embryologist, which one to choose? So I think, you know, like, so I feel that these are the major challenges faced by uh, embryologists. Okay. Okay. So, uh, Dr. Michelle, now that we've heard from both uh, Dr. Vani and Dr. Sujata, where does Life Whisperer come in terms of addressing these challenges? Yeah, it's really interesting because the process of embryo development is, is so complex. As um, Sujatha and Dr. Vani mentioned, it's, it's a really scientific process. It's dependent on a great many factors. And then at the end of the day, the embryologist or the treating doctor has a really important decision to make for the patient about which of those embryos to transfer first and which to freeze or which to do genetic testing on. That's an incredibly difficult decision for them to make. Um, and the reason that it's difficult is because embryos are very complex. Um, they're complex in their physiology, they're complex in the way that they look, and actually we're limited by our eye in terms of how many features we can see down a microscope when we're analysing them. So the way that Life Whisperer and artificial intelligence helps is by giving a different opinion or a different perspective on the healthiness of the embryo. And the AI is really um, important and critical because it can analyze really complex features of the embryos that you just can't visualize with the human eye. So it's seeing the embryos in a different way to what we see them as humans down a microscope. And that's really valuable. So what it allows us to do is be much more granular and much more specific about um, the features of those embryos and therefore the like of each of the embryos resulting in a pregnancy. It allows us to rank order embryos um, very effectively and accurately so that we know that we can help the embryologist pick the very best embryo first time and reduce that time to pregnancy for patients. And that's the most important thing. So it's not replacing the embryologist function, but it's certainly providing another way of analysing those embryos so that we can get the very best outcome for the patients. Okay, thank you, Michelle. So uh, Dr. Vani, how important is it to have a good embryo for a successful pregnancy? 
Well, um, in an IVF pregnancy or in any pregnancy for that matter, there are two players. One is the embryo and the other is the endometrium. Now the endometrium is the lining, the inner lining of the uterine cavity. The embryo plays a major role, about 75 to 80%, and the endometrium plays a minor role, about 20 to 25%. So it is very important to select a good embryo and to have a good embryo, because if the embryo selection is not okay, or if we don't have a good embryo to transfer, it may result in failure of the cycle, or it may result in a miscarriage. So that's how it is, that's how important an embryo, a good embryo is for a pregnancy. Okay, okay. So now that the good embryo is really important for a transfer, how can you identify a good embryo for transfer, Dr. Sujata? Uh, so identification of good embryos, okay, the current practice is based on two techniques. 90% of the clinics across this world would look at an embryo and select an embryo based on the morphological features. You, uh, you know, so the size of the embryo, shape of the embryo, how many cells are there, are these cells symmetrical? You know, that looking at a, uh, you know, uh, just like an outward uh, appearance. To draw an analogy, it is like, you know, like looking at you and me, I'm trying to identify or to find out if all is well with us. Okay. So, which is, which may not be the right method because, you know, outward it would look okay, but then functionally we may not be competent enough. So that is one way of identifying a good embryo, which has been in practice. The second one, which is followed in few clinics across this country is an expensive one, which requires some kind of a technological intervention where you look not only at the morphology, but you also look at the developmental rate, the kinetics. Say, for example, if you are looking at an embryo on uh, day one, you see how well the embryo progresses to day two. And from there, like what happens, uh, you know, on uh, its, uh, how is its journey to day three? So like, you know, the developmental pattern is also assessed, which is called as morphokinetics. But this actually requires expensive equipment. See, uh, in morphological assessment, what we do is we take the embryo from the incubator, you put it under the microscope, you look at the embryos, you assess them. But whereas in morphokinetics, the embryo is placed in an incubator over which there would be a camera, and this camera would be taking images every 10 minutes, every five minutes, whatever it is, and then it would give you a complete picture. So these are the two techniques which are actually in practice to identify a good embryo. Okay, thank you, Sujata. So Dr. Michelle, how does Life Whisperer help these embryologists with selecting the best quality embryo for an IVF transfer? Yeah, as, as um, Sujata mentioned, selecting the embryo currently is done either through morphological assessment or through the time-lapse imaging, um, looking at the morphokinetics um, analysis. What the artificial intelligence does is assesses almost in the same way as the morphological assessment, um, the embryo at the end of its development timeline. So right before that embryo is being chosen for transfer amongst its other embryos for that patient, um, that, that's when the life whisperer application is used. So we call it an endpoint analysis. And the AI is again looking at really complex patterns of features that can predict whether a pregnancy is likely to result or not, allowing them to select the healthiest embryo. And essentially what it's doing is it's taking the guesswork out of the equation. It's making a much more standardised assessment. So we're not reliant on the expertise of different embryologists being able to do that visual grading. Um, the AI has seen many tens of thousands of embryos where some of the more junior embryologists may not have ever seen more than 100 or 200 embryos in their entire career. So it's, allow it's allowing it to make a very objective and standardised assessment of the embryo quality. And that's really important um, for being able to make that selection process. I guess the other um, advantage of the AI is that it has been trained on many different 
cameras, many different IVF clinics, many different clinical processes for developing those embryos. And so it's seen a whole world full of embryos. And so it's very good at being able to bring that global knowledge back into each and every clinic and being able to bring that expertise through the AI to be able to make that selection process more effective and accurate. Oh, okay, that's excellent, uh, actually. So um, the next question is an interesting one, and this one's for Dr. Sujata. So uh, are there any methods to detect genetic disorders in embryos? Yes, there are. Okay, the most common method is uh, called the uh, pre-implantation genetic testing, an invasive method where small bits of embryo is removed and which is sent for genetic analysis. Okay, so now the uh, disadvantage with this technique is it's an invasive procedure. And then uh, see, as a, uh, you know, like uh, an embryo can be biopsied, like bits of embryos can be taken, uh, preferably from a day five embryo. So that means like your culture system has to be excellent where it can actually support the growth of a, an embryo until day five. And then again, you need a, a trained embryologist because this is a very invasive procedure and it also needs a lot of training and validation for the embryologist. So individually, you just uh, take an embryo and then you kind of biopsy it. And again, the other process of putting this biopsied material into a, a, a tube is also a, a, a very, uh, fine procedure which needs a lot of training and then you send this particular material for genetic analysis so that is the most common technique nowadays there is another technique where uh, you know like which is sort of developing which is not invasive where uh, they look at the media in which the embryos are cultured and see embryos are constantly spewing out uh, dna into the uh, culture media so what happens here is you pick up the DNA from the culture media, you don't touch the embryo at all, but just, you know, like you pick up the DNA from the media and send it for genetic analysis. You know, earlier it started with say, for example, uh, 50 to 60% of concordance. Now they are talking about 80% of concordance, but I think this technique is yet to be uh, fine tuned. Now with both these techniques, the major issue would be the turnaround time. So if you do a biopsy today, or if you do a, a spent media analysis today, by the time you get the result, it would take maybe a minimum of uh, 10 days and it can even run to uh, uh, two weeks. So you don't get the results immediately, but these are the two techniques which are actually uh, uh, you know, used uh, in practice these days. Okay, thank you, Dr. Sujata. So, um, so Dr. Michelle, will Life Whisperer be able to analyze the embryo for genetic disorders and how? Thanks so much. It's, it's a really interesting area of, of research and development, actually. And Life Whisperer does actually analyze the genetic integrity of embryos. It doesn't yet identify individual chromosome or genetic disorders in the same way that the traditional genetic testing does. But what it can do is analyze the embryo images to look at the physical features of the embryo that correlate with very serious genetic changes. And we've shown that it's very effective at being able to identify whether there's a serious genetic issue with those embryos. And so what that means is that in the same way that it can assess embryos for their likelihood of creating a pregnancy, it can also determine whether an embryo is likely to have a serious genetic um, disorder or a genetic defect. And why that's important is because it can help guide, again, that decision about what you do with those embryos. Do you do a definitive genetic testing and wait for those results, or do you go ahead with the fresh transfer um, on the basis of those results? So it provides an alternative. It's completely non-invasive. It's not, as I said, identifying the specific chromosomal changes or the genetic disorders but it can very effectively analyze whether an embryo is likely to have a serious genetic defect. And so that's really exciting for us. And we're currently these, um, this Life Whisperer Genetics application is actually being used and tested all around the world um, from Europe to Australia and Asia and in India as well, which is really exciting. Um, so I think the future of 
artificial intelligence in the IVF sector is really around non-invasive testing, is around low cost and accessible services for patients that don't require expensive processes or invasive processes that impact the embryo and don't require expensive pieces of equipment that the patients ultimately end up having to pay for. So it's very exciting times and I think just even though it's not to do with the question around genetics, we're also looking to apply AI to other areas of the IVF process, like optimising the stimulation protocols for patients and analysing oocytes or the eggs um, that are the precursor to the embryo. So I think it can really have a huge impact across that whole process, but patients can access the viability in genetics right now. Okay. Thank you, Michelle. Uh, so Dr. Varney, Based on your experience using Life Whisperer, do you feel that will be added value to the patients? Well, um, I've been using Life Whisperer for some time. And there are two aspects I'd like to look at. First of all, um, we've spoken about this extensively now, but um, embryo selection. Sometimes we have women with polycystic ovaries and they generally produce many embryos, many uh, similar looking uh, blastocysts. And it's useful to know which to transfer so that they can get pregnant quickly. So you chose the, choose the right one and life whisperer definitely plays a role there. The second thing is when women do not get uh, so many embryos and they have actually poor quality blastocysts, it's still good to grade them because it serves to counsel the patient about the prognosis, about what their likely, likelihood is of getting pregnant. So I think it plays a role in both circumstances. Uh, that's as far as embryo selection goes. Now, um, another thing which of course is very important is as Michelle said, and as Sujata said, standardization. That is, uh, there is no subjective variation. Uh, it's standardized and it's very objective and that's how the embryo quality is determined. I think that's a very important factor. And the third thing is the cost. Now, as Sujata said, if we were to use time lapse, it would mean a huge investment in terms of equipment um, and training as well. But with Life Whisperer, all you need to do is to be able to take pictures with your existing camera. And we get the results in a matter of minutes. And the patients also uh, are quite happy that they can see the results. Uh, so these, I think, are the advantages of Life Whisperer and uh, is what I've noted in the past uh, few months, maybe a year of using. Thank you, Dr. Bani. So, uh, Dr. Sujata, based on your experience using Life Whisperer, do you feel there will be added value in terms of selecting the most viable embryo for a successful pregnancy? Uh, definitely, I feel uh, it would add value because we did a trial and we did make some interesting observations during the trial. See, this life whisperer actually grades embryo. It just gives a numerical value. So we just looked at the embryo, which got the least score. So we picked up the embryos, which were scored less than two. And then we compared it with our uh, uh, evaluation or our grading. So 22 embryos were there in that category. And 11 were, we had also graded it as D, which means like you have to discard them. But interestingly, the other 11, there were few B and C grade embryos there, which actually would have been used for transfer according to our grading. Now, as Dr. Vani rightly pointed out in the beginning, one of the major things in an IVF is time to pregnancy. So what would have happened is we would have frozen or we would have transferred this embryo. Patients you know, may not have conceived. Then they will come back for the other embryos which are in store. So eventually what happens is the time to pregnancy is you know, like it's prolonged. Sometimes what happens, or at least in few cases, we have noticed that when that happens, the patient actually, you know, loses their uh, hope. And then there are a lot of dropouts. In spite of having frozen embryos in store, there are patients who would just, you know, like drop out from the treatment cycle and they say either they go to some other center or they, you know, totally stop giving an attempt for uh, IVF. So I think this would definitely help us to pick up the right embryos. And another major factor, especially in our system is, see, we are a group of around 36 laboratories and uh, we are an embryology team of over 80 embryologists. 
and though you know how much ever we try to kind of uh, uh, train them validate them do in house validation and all that still there could be lot of differences between different embryologists and as a group it can actually reflect on our success rates but having such a system in place it would totally eliminate that issue you know every single embryologist and embryologist in, in a remote area like hisar or uh, you know patna would also grade the same way or would also pick up the embryo you know the same way another trained embryologist one who has more than 10 years of experience or even more than that would pick up so uh, i feel definitely it helps and this standardization eventually would also improve the success rates because you know once these things are kind of you know put in place automatically your success rate will also improve so uh, i definitely would feel that this adds value to an ivf program uh thank you dr sujata so dr michelle we've now heard from dr vani and dr sujata that artificial intelligence improves ivf success rates so when will life whisperer be widely available at local fertility clinics and what are the challenges that you are facing well life whisperer is already available at um, many ivf clinics around the world so we do have regulatory approvals in around 2/3 of the world's market including authorization to sell in in india uh we have a number of clinics that are already utilizing the technology in india so if it is something that patients are interested in then um they can certainly approach their ivf center about using life whisper and we can have them set up in a very short amount of time it's actually quite an easy and intuitive system to use and uh, i think one of the one of the things that we've really tried to focus on with life whisper is making it really easy to use within the current clinical workflow so not creating a lot of extra work for the lab um because they're already under a lot of pressure to process and manage the embryo development process and just making that analysis really simple and easy for them has been really important um in terms of the challenges that are faced in bringing this technology to local clinics the main challenge is for us are making sure that we do the adequate clinical testing to meet the regulatory requirements that are required around the world and this is a medical device it has been tested extensively internationally in many different clinical environments um we publish scientific studies all the time in journals and at, at major conferences to make sure that it's scientifically backed um and that it's evidence based so that when clinics utilize our technology we know that they're um they've got the very best chances of of helping their patients and improving outcomes but the technology is available and um it would be to go to a clinic that's currently using the technology or to approach your clinic if you're interested in using life whisper okay thank you dr michelle Uh, so in conclusion artificial intelligence powered software life whisperer improves ivf success rates as proven at janenum fertility center and nova ivf life whisperer reduces time to pregnancy with fewer cycles for the couples and provides as much as 25% improvement in ivf success rates and now let's open the floor for audience questions um and uh, i'm waiting for the questions to start being poured in so once i get the questions here i shall ask them so so dr vani i have had five ivf transfers the last one was on ivig and interlipid and got positive but was chemical preg chemical pregnancy with pro progesterone value 50 doctor saying immune issue how do, how do i proceed um there's a lot more details actually which i need uh, but for from what i you've told me um we don't uh, give intralipid we don't give iv uh, immunoglobulin as well we don't believe in that and uh, really uh, that patient i don't know where the patient is but it would be nice to see the patient because we always like challenges like this and uh, if we did see the patient here we could make a plan for her um we believe in doing era testing 
And um, I really don't know about the quality of the embryos from that patient. Um, so it's very difficult to answer that question completely because I need more details. Uh, but these two things which she's had, the IV immunoglobulin and intralipid, is not what we do. And there is no clear evidence saying that they are of any benefit. Okay, okay. Thank you, Dr. Vani. The next one's for Dr. Sujata. Does life whisperer help in decreasing time to pregnancy? And does this mean that I will need lesser number of cycles? Yes, absolutely. Because, you know, like if you can identify the best embryos in the first shot itself, you know, like it automatically reduces the time to pregnancy. See, I uh, remember a, a, a case when I was working in one of the clinics earlier in Kerala, that patient had nearly some 15 or 16 embryos frozen as two in individual cryotops. Patient was living in uh, Middle East and for every embryo transfer, they would travel all the way to India. They will have the embryo transfer and go. And then uh, for some reason, the pregnancy happened with the last cryotop. So you can imagine how many, but they were persistent. It was okay, but most of the patients are not. So I think having a system which can help you to identify the most viable, the most uh, functionally and developmentally competent embryos would reduce the time to pregnancy. No doubt on that. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Sujata. So I'm still waiting for more questions to come in. So um, are there any more questions? Just give me a second. Okay. Oh, yeah, we have one here. Yeah. Dr. Michelle, have you looked at letting patients use Life Whisperer because you wouldn't, that would, sorry, uh, because wouldn't that give patients liberty to check their embryo viability score and compare it with embryologist's score? Um, no, we firmly believe that the embryologist is really important part of the decision making process. They're the experts around what um, has happened in terms of the development of those embryos and how to analyse them. And there's a whole range of different ways that they analyse um, the development of the embryo and a lot of knowledge that they have and understanding that they have around embryo quality as well. Um, Life Whisperer is a tool that is designed to be used by embryologists to assist them to make that critical decision. So it's only one small part of the process, um, but a critical one. But I think what you've raised is the issue around patient transparency, and we haven't touched upon this. Oh, actually, Dr. Varney mentioned something about this earlier. Um, one of the challenges for patients is understanding what the scoring system means for them, um, how their embryos are being graded and how the decision is being made about which embryo to transfer. And that can be quite challenging for patients to try and understand and um, to, you know, to give patients comfort and to counsel them around why a particular embryo is being chosen over another one. So one of the things that we've done with Life Whisperer is create really nice patient reports that can be given to the patient that explain exactly what those scores mean, that explain how many patients become pregnant within that score bracket of embryos so that it manages their expectations around a potential success of the treatment. And that's been really important factor for a lot of patients and something that they really love about the system. And to give you an example, you know, a very low scoring embryo between zero and 2.5 with Life Whisperer, even though it's a very low scoring embryo, actually there's still quite a large proportion of patients that can become pregnant from embryos that score that level. So it's not to say that if you have a low scoring embryo, you won't become pregnant, but it's a tool to tell you that if you've got an embryo that has a higher score, then you're much better off transferring that one first and you've got a much higher chance of achieving a pregnancy and reducing the number of treatment cycles that need to be done. So I wouldn't definitely wouldn't suggest that it is done without, um, without the clinic or the embryologist. Okay, thank you, Michelle. So Dr. Varney, this one's for you. Can the medications of IVF cause any other ailments or do they have any contribution in developing lifestyle diseases at an early age? No, there is no evidence to say that uh, stimulation medications cause a problem and uh, they don't cause uh, lifestyle diseases. Okay, 
Thank you, Dr. Vani. And the next question is also for you. Mm -hmm. uh, from your time using Life Whisperer, how has it impacted success rate at your fertility center? And how do patients feel about using Life Whisperer? See, uh, the thing is, we've been using it for some time. And I think there is a really good correlation between uh, the scoring and uh, implantation and ongoing pregnancy rate. If an embryo is scored, uh, has a good score, it invariably implants and gives us a healthy pregnancy. Um, patients are very happy to take uh, to use Life Whisper uh, because having come that far, uh, they don't find it a problem to spend a little extra money uh, to get their scoring done. And they're very happy to see the scores usually. Okay. And uh, you won't believe I have a banner in my clinic which says uh, everything about life whisperer. And I have patients who are undergoing IUI uh, come up to me and say, could we have that please? So, uh, you know, so it's, it, it is, pe people are looking at it and asking for it. Um, okay. So that's what I think about life whisperer. Uh, I think it dramatically shortens the time to pregnancy. And as Sujata pointed out, sometimes we have so many embryos, all of them look the same and we keep transferring two by two or one by one. And we reach the last embryo and then the patient gets pregnant. And sometimes they even drop out in between and go to a different clinic. So this way, we're sure that we're transferring the best embryo first. Okay, thank you, Dr. Vani. So uh, Dr. Sujata, this one's interesting. Uh, can I freeze my embryos at an early age? And does this mean my embryo quality will be good? How long do you freeze frozen embryos last? So embryos can be frozen at an early age as long as you have a partner. Okay, if you don't have a partner, then you freeze the eggs. Now, how long can it be stored? I think the ICMR allows you to store for uh, five years. Uh, Dr. Vani, I think you have to help me out here. Uh, for this kind of fertility preservation, does that, uh, you know, like the, the number of years, does it, uh, the ICMR say anything about it? Now, I don't think it matters, uh, Sujata, because there are patients who come after four years and five years to have their second child with the same embryos. So I don't think it really matters. No, the, uh, I'm just asking about the ICMR guidelines. Because, yeah, you know, that's why I don't, I, I, I don't really go by the guidelines because sometimes when they come back for their second pregnancy fails, they have some more embryos, third pregnancy crosses five years, and we're still using the same embryos. Uh, so really, it's a difficult... Um, <laughs> So, but I think, you know, the uh, the longest time uh, an embryo has been in store and then given a pregnancy, whatever is quoted in the literature is 23 years, I think. So, I don't think anything happens as long as your storage conditions are fine, the embryos are not affected. At least that is what the present uh, uh, information is about. Okay, that's, that's, that was helpful, uh, Dr. Sujata. So, uh, the next one's for uh, Dr. Michelle. Do you consider AI as medical device? And if so, why? Uh, it's not so much whether we consider AI as a medical device, but the industry regulators do consider this as a device. And the reason is um, quite reasonable. So anything that assists with selecting a healthy embryo is going to impact patient outcomes and therefore it needs to be really thoroughly tested, it needs to be scientifically and clinically validated and so therefore it's considered as a medical device by um, regulators around the world. So we need to get regulatory approvals and conduct the relative um, or the relevant in-clinic testing for Life Whisperer to ensure that it passes all of those hurdles and that it's fit for purpose. So it's not so much our opinion about whether it's a medical device or not. We consider it to be clinical decision support, um, an application that assists with clinical decision support, but certainly it is considered by regulators as a medical device. Okay, okay, that's nice. So uh, the next one is also for you. What is the cost of this AI embryo uh, selection process? And uh, how is it charged by the fertility center? So for, for pricing information, they'll need to reach out to me directly. Um, we do have distributors in the um, Go Healthy in India who deal with all of the pricing of our product. But what I can tell you is that 
Um, the price is actually relatively low cost comparable to all of the other technologies that are utilised for this. So comparable to time lapse imaging, comparable to genetic testing and comparable to um, to some of the other non-invasive um, genetic testing, this is very low cost for patients and it's quite a scalable approach. So if anyone's interested in pricing information, they can reach out to me directly at michelle at lifewhisperit.com um, or they can contact Go Healthy um, directly for that information. Okay, thank you, Dr. Michelle. So uh, the next one is for Dr. Vani. Um, Dr. Vani, what are the success rate of IVF in the age of 35 plus and uh, at your fertility center, is it better because of using Life Whisperer? See, at the end of the day, Life Whisperer does, uh, selects the right embryo for transfer. Okay. But if a person, a woman, is greater than 35 years old, her chance of uh, making good quality embryos gradually reduces towards 40 years of age. So all Life Whisperer can do is, if she has a good quality embryo, a few embryos, to select the best so that she can get pregnant quickly. It doesn't actually change the quality of the embryo. The quality of the embryo would depend on the sperm, would depend on the egg, and depend on the age of the individual patient. Okay, okay. Thank you, Dr. Vani. The next one is also for you. Um, what are the success rate of IVF in the, uh, yeah, I'm sorry. Um, I'm sorry, I just missed the question. So next one is actually for Dr. Sujata. Um, regarding the factors that affect embryo selection and embryo quality, how do you maintain a consistent quality amongst all your centers? Okay, so uh, that's a very interesting question. Actually, what we do is we have continuous evaluation uh, in, uh, uh, you know, in place. So uh, say every week, we have uh, we actually uh, distribute few uh, images of embryos. We ask our embryologists to score them, and then you know, like we assess based on that. So it is like not a one-time uh, effort. This is an ongoing process. We have to continuously monitor the embryo, the embryologists, the the way they score the embryos, and then correct them. If somebody needs an intense training, then we actually bring them to one of our uh, you know uh, leading centers, and then we train them there. So uh, basically, it is kind of monitoring and correcting their uh, the way they evaluate the embryos. Okay. Or they grade the embryos. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Sujata. So um, actually, I think the questions have. Uh, yeah, we have one more question though. This one's for Dr. Michelle. So uh, when you say that AI looks at factors that human eye cannot see. How much more accurate can it be? Well, our clinical studies have shown that it's quite a bit more accurate. So obviously it depends on the accuracy of the embryologist that you're comparing it to. Um, but on average in our international clinical studies, it's up to 25% more accurate than the visual inspection. And the reason is when we look at embryos down a microscope, we're measuring certain things like the size, the shape, the inner cell mass, um, they're macro level features of the embryo. So they're very um, sort of obvious and things that we can see with the eye. And even then it's quite difficult to get a consistent grade. But what the AI does is it looks at very complex micro patterns within the, um, within the embryo. So it's not looking at five or six different features. It's looking at potentially thousands of different combinations of features. And it relates those features to whether patients have become pregnant from that type of embryo. And so it just becomes very good at categorizing and it almost builds what you would say is like a catalog of embryo images where it can use those as a reference um, for new embryos that it sees. And it's very accurate at being able to categorize embryos on the basis of their likelihood of creating a pregnancy. So I, I think it's just more to do with the depth and the complexity that the AI can analyze in the images. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Michelle. So uh, we have a question for Dr. Vani. Uh, what's the best time to come for IVF treatment? Before what age should I come for the treatment for the best outcome? Well, I think, um, first of all, we need to check whether that person actually needs IVF. And um, 
I think less than 35 years as soon as possible, really. If they do, do need IVF. Okay, okay. Thank you, Dr. Vani. So uh, we have a question for Dr. Sujata. Are there specific lifestyle factors that affect embryo quality? And if so, how can I maintain good embryo quality? Uh, embryo quality, I think, you know, like uh, lifestyle factors that are uh, associated with the uh, gamete quality have been identified. For example, uh, obesity, uh, PCO, all these things can actually, and then some kind of a lifestyle modification, like maintaining healthy weight and eating, uh, you know, right kind of food, actually to a certain extent can help. Same way with the uh, sperm quality also, uh, like not to increase the uh, uh, temperature, testicular temperature, like uh, uh, jobs such as um, where, you know, like um, uh, truck drivers or people who are sitting in the car for a very long time or, you know, like uh, uh, jobs which actually involve sitting in one place for a very long time. I think all these things can have an impact on the kind of uh, uh, medication. Sometimes, you know, it could be just some alternative medicines you are taking for your well-being, which actually can have an impact on your uh, gamete quality. So, you know, those things. Uh, I think, you know, like basically to have a healthy uh, lifestyle, to have a, a healthy weight, I think it would. I'm not saying that it would completely remove all problems with the egg or the sperm, but to a certain extent can really help. I think Dr. Vani can add more to it. Um, as I think you've outlined everything. Uh, the only thing I wanted to add uh, from the previous question is that somebody asked, when should I come to IVF? Really, it's a very broad question. Um, but the thing I'd like to say is if somebody is contemplating on a pregnancy or contemplating on postponing a pregnancy, uh, and if they're above 30 or 32 years, it's best to check at least the AMH level to see if the egg numbers are okay. And if everything is okay, then they can wait. If there is a concern, they can always visit the clinic. And uh, then the doctor, I'm sure the fertility specialist will advise uh, the person about what to do. Okay. Yeah, that's a good add-on point, Dr. Vani. Dr. Vani, we also have another question for you. What is your viewpoint on uh, psychopharmacology consideration for infertility patients and potential interactions between psychometric meditation, medications and infertility treatment? Well, um, psychopharmacology, uh, in a sense, if somebody is stressed, we usually deal with it. We have counselors here who can take care of it. Uh, but other than that, we don't do anything special. There are certain couples who want to have acupuncture and they go ahead and have acupuncture. But apart from that, there are no add-ons really offered here in the center. Okay. Is there anything you'd like to add on, Sujata? I think sometimes you have these kind of counseling sessions, the group counseling sessions. I think some centers, they even allow the patients to talk to a couple who had become negative or who had become positive, like kind of interact, so which would kind of help them. But other than that, I don't think yeah. there are any other intervention which can actually, uh, you know, to be uh, can be done to overcome these issues. Yeah, you'd be surprised because actually when people meet in the clinic, they form groups and they have actually have Jalanam WhatsApp groups where they exchange treatments and they kind of compare notes and it sometimes becomes difficult for us also because two yeah. people, two different people are unique in their own way, really. Yes. So um, that's something which also happens in between. Okay, okay. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Dr. Michelle, in addition to AI-powered embryo selection, are there any technologies that uh, you are working on to identify PCOS and help improve IVF success rates? Yes, we are. Um, thanks for asking that question. So Life Whisperer, what we're, what we're trying to do is add value across the whole IVF process, try and improve patient outcomes. Um, as Dr. Varney mentioned before, we can't create better embryos, but we can help select them. However, if we start using AI for egg assessment, then potentially we can select healthier eggs, which will lead to healthier embryos that you can then select and improve outcomes. 
Um, in the same way, um, the endometrium is really important in um, its receptivity is really important in determining whether an implantation succeeds or not through IVF. And so we are interested in looking at um, endometrial receptivity. We're interested in looking at um, endometriosis as a condition itself, and that's heavy image-based analysis as well. And so we've got some global collaborations that we're working on that problem with as well. So we're interested in a whole range of different areas from genetics to viability to oocyte assessment, endometriosis, um, and then beyond that, we're also interested in other women's health applications like um, breast and ovarian cancer. Okay, okay, that's interesting and very helpful. Uh, so Michelle, can Life Whisperer identify genetic issues in embryos before the uh, implantation stage itself? Yes. Um, so again, we're not identifying very specific genetic changes that are happening, but what we can do is identify when the physical um, features of the embryo change because of a genetic defect. So um, it's almost the way that in which I describe it is Life Whisperer can be used as a pre-screen for genetic um, abnormalities. And the reason that that's important is because if you want to select embryos in order to do a genetic testing approach, you don't want to be biopsying and doing a genetic testing on every embryo. It's very expensive and very invasive, and the embryos may not be fit for the biopsy procedure. So you'd want to be able to tell which of those embryos are more likely to be genetically normal before you go to the bother of doing one of those tests. So in that way, it's very helpful. In many countries in the world, genetic testing is not allowed for embryos. And so Life Whisperer provides an alternative um, to that genetic testing, which at least gives um, some level of information of the likelihood of genetic um, normality of the embryos. And also, if you're looking to freeze embryos, um, you know, it's really important to understand the quality, both from the perspective of implantation potential, but also um, genetic integrity. And so doing the life whisperer analysis prior to freezing or prior to implantation or prior to a more definitive genetic test is, is really effective and efficient way of making sure that you're, um, you know, non-invasively doing every analysis that you possibly can to improve your chances. Okay, thank you, Dr. Michel. And with that, uh, I think we've come to the end of all the questions that our audience have sent in. So, um, so having heard from the experts, I think Life Whisperer is a boon to any couple planning for an IVF pregnancy. And uh, for IVF centers, it is clear that in a given time period, they would be able to cater to more couples with successful pregnancies and thereby their performance would be more by at least 25% to 30. Uh, so let's look forward to using Life Whisperer at all fertility centers in the country soon. So, uh, and I'd like to also uh, thank uh, Fertility Dost and Voice of Healthcare for uh, streaming in our live session. And uh, I'd like to conclude by wishing all of you a happy World IVF Day and a great weekend for joining us. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank Thanks you. so much. Thank you. Thank you.